Just as our bodies grow and develop, so do all our organs, including the brain. But what can science tell us about how different stages of brain development affect our ability to learn? About how the learning environment impacts on that development? And about the implications for learning when this development goes wrong? To find out more about the development of children's brains, we visited Dr Fred Dick of Birkbeck College London, a leading expert in the field, and asked him firstly about how we begin to learn. Experience expectant learning is really uh, the kind of learning that, that an animal or human does quite early on in development, so for instance around birth or a little bit afterwards. And this is a development that is relying upon, upon features in the environment that you can reliably encounter. So for instance, you'll hear lots of different uh, auditory frequencies, you'll get visual input, you'll get light input. And the uh, developing system really relies upon this kind of low level uh, perceptual input to kind of set up its circuits. Experience dependent development, which is really what we think of as being most of the human experience, particularly in the school age, is really the kind of learning that you do um, every day and that reflects your experiences and actions as an individual. So you frame a shot with the back one, you get your composition. Oh, okay. The front one you focus with, and when it beeps, it's in focus. So it's setting up changes in, in synapses, the connections in brains, that are allowing you to learn specific things about, uh, about the world. And this is really where we start to build up the scaffolding of knowledge that allows us to do many complex skills. So we know that there are sensitive periods when experience shapes the development of the brain. Educationalists have argued that this has implications for the age at which certain subjects are introduced into the curriculum, Testing. suggesting, for instance, that it's better to start teaching foreign languages in primary schools rather than waiting for secondary. Duh, very good. Twa, very good. Katra. It is also argued that activities involving motor skills are easier to learn at a younger age. But is learning limited to these sensitive periods, or can the brain continually change and adapt? Brain plasticity we used to think of as something that was just happened during development and then shut off. But in fact, what we know now is that brain plasticity is really perhaps the fundamental organizing principle in brain function. We see plasticity at every level of brain function happening throughout life up until your dying day. A study in 2004 demonstrated the ability of the brain to change with learning by showing that adults new to juggling experienced significant expansion in an area of the brain associated with visual processing after just a three-month training period. If increased stimulation enhances brain function, then does the provision of an enriched environment in a school setting benefit children's learning? A 10-year research project on the effective provision of preschool and primary education, EPI, looked at the effect of the educational environment on the development of children aged 3 to 11. The project, based at the Institute of Education in London, is led by Professor Iram Siraj Blatchford. It's a mixed method study that's not only picking up um, the outcomes that the children have over a period of time, but also we're looking at the, the, the settings that the children went to when they were very small, the effective settings, and looking at the practices that are taking place in those settings. EPI is following over 3,000 children, gathering information through a range of survey techniques, including case studies and interviews. We picked up large numbers of children in each preschool setting, 141 preschool settings, and then we were able to look at which were the more effective settings and which were the less effective settings in terms of children's attainment over time. It also looks at the practices that led to that progress. The research firmly confirmed what many in the education sector know instinctively. 
that success is not simply a matter of having more physical resources, but depends much more on the quality of the staff. For many of our children, the richest resource seemed to be the human resource that they had available to them. And one of the things EPI found was that settings that had more highly qualified staff were providing the kind of guided thinking, the kind of sustained shared thinking, um, not the thinking that dominates children's minds, but the kind that guides children's minds and extends them. Enriched environments are important, but they can be a little hit and miss, depending on what the child takes from it. It really is the quality of the adult and the stimulus that the adult provides in helping the child engage with the environment. It's like having a curriculum. It's, it's great to have a curriculum, but it's the adult that makes it accessible to the child. And if the adult's the quality of the training is poor, then the child doesn't access the curriculum as well. Whilst the quality of adult training may be an obvious factor in a child's development, the study found some less expected results. In our case studies, we found an interesting relationship between the social and the cognitive development. We found that those settings that tended to prioritise both equally had better outcomes. We know from talking to the parents and the staff that most of them tended to prioritise social development. I think it's, it's, it's a pattern that's persisted over a number of decades that if you support children's social development, the cognitive will come. You know, if you get the social right first, the cognitive will come. But we actually found, to our surprise, that the settings that saw social and cognitive development as complementary actually did the best for their children. The study also found that the quality of the early home learning environment had a direct impact on children's cognitive development, reinforcing the conclusion that simply adding more physical resources to our school environments doesn't automatically correlate to improving children's learning. Not all brains develop in the same way, and for some this can lead to quite specific difficulties with learning, such as dyscalculia, which involves problems with numeracy. Count in twos for me and see how many twos we've got in the ta on the table, how many groups... Toby is dyscalculic. He's bright in all other subjects, yet a basic maths problem confounds him. He can't make the usual connections. Fourteen... Fifteen. Nearly. Fourteen. Sixteen. Seven. Eighteen. Twenty. Twenty. So five twos make... Ten. Good. So we know we've got five twos under here. So what would be the next one? If five twos are ten, then six twos would be... Twelve. Good boy. It would be one group of two more. Ten, twelve. Excellent. If six twos are twelve, we know we've got six twos under here. If six twos are twelve, then seven twos would be... Ten... 12, 13, nearly two more, wouldn't it? 12, 14, 14, good boy. Professor Brian Butterworth is the leading authority on dyscalculia in the UK. Dyscalculia is a problem in acquiring numeracy. Specific to numeracy, it doesn't apply necessarily to other branches of mathematics. It's really a problem of understanding simple number concepts, knowing what fiveness is without having to count, knowing that fiveness and threeness is eightness. Uh, that's at the core of dyscalculia. How the brain processes maths is, is, is slightly complicated. It involves two areas of the brain, here in the parietal lobes and also in the frontal lobes. And the important thing to remember particularly in relation to dyscalculia, is that the, the numerical processing is essentially a parietal lobe function. Number eight, number nine... We don't know how brain function is different in people with dyscalculia at the moment. We know there seem to be some abnormalities in brain structure. 
which affect um, these parts of the parietal lobe. One of the implications of Professor Butterworth's research is that the highly specialised system in the brain used to process simple number concepts is defective. Here at Emerson House, Specialist Support Centre for Children with Numeracy and Literacy Difficulties, they work to help children deal with dyscalculia number problems by using very structured multi-sensory teaching, focusing on sets of concrete objects. Most dyscalculic children um, are not able to subitize, which means they can't recognise small arrays of dots without counting them one by one, whereas typical children would see three dots and just know it was a three. So let's have a look at eight now. See if I'm putting, I'm not sure how many I'm putting out. Can you make the dot pattern of eight? Yes. So we train these children using familiar dice patterns, which most young children know anyway. So we've got the dot pattern of six, three and three, and we've got the dot pattern of eight. Which two numbers can you see in there hiding? Four and four. Excellent, good five. It's very important that they tr are trained to reason from key facts, such as five and five because reasoning um, is the one thing that dyscalculic children find very difficult. Right, so let's make the dot pattern just like you did. All right, so we said we can see two and two. Now, what can you see now? You can see two, two and, and one. Two and one more, yes, so we've got two, two and, and three. three. If two and two make four, then two and three would make, make five. Excellent, good boy. The little boy I am working with has been working on dot patterns and counting for three months. When he arrived, he could barely count to 20 and had no idea of the numerosity of the number four and he was confused about which number was bigger than another number, and these is, this is under 10. So in three months, he's built up a feel for the number system, up to 10 and up to 100 and beyond, and is beginning to reason from key facts. OK, can you make 11 for me now? How do we go one more? 10. 11. Mm -hmm. Carry on. One more. 11. 20. Careful. 11, 12, 12. At the moment, one of the problems is that most people take the view that the child is stupid. Uh, that teachers take this view very often. Parents certainly take this view. Children themselves take this view. Why is it that they can't add 3 plus 3 even though they're 9 years old? It has to be because they're stupid. If you can demonstrate that there's something specific, uh, confined in the brain of that child, then the diagnosis won't be stupidity, it'll be something specific. Rather in the way that 30 years ago people were able to demonstrate that dyslexia is a specific disability and more recently it's associated with uh, abnormal brain structure and abnormal brain activity.